the pressers with Matt Mallory and Clint Necro. Brought to you by Public Safety and Education and the Trigger Pressers Union. And now, your hosts. Welcome to Meet the Pressers. I'm Matt Mallory, founder and president of PSN Ed, aka Public Safety and Education. And my name is Clint Macro, founder of the Trigger Pressers Union. This episode of Meet the Pressers is made possible with the generous support of PowerTac flashlights, Lee Armory, and EZ2C targets. Over the last three days, we fellowshiped with like-minded individuals at the USCCA Expo that happened to take place in my hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And what a mighty fine town it is, Clint. Why, thank you. We actually had the chance to sit down with Grant Gallagher, the co-founder, co-creator of National Training Teacher Day, a fellow instructor and training counselor. So Grant, tell us about yourself. We're going to get into uh, National Train a Teacher Day, and, and you're the brainchild behind that. But I would like to have you explain to folks what you do, what you're about, and what led you to becoming an educator as far as uh, firearms training and safety and defensive training. Well, um, I guess that, like a lot of people, um, when, once you start to shoot, then people begin to ask you, can you take them shooting? And because my career has been in education, university education primarily, I figured there was probably a proper way to do it. And that led me into classes with um, a guy in New Jersey that many of you will know, Anthony Calandro. And he took me through my first NRA classes. And then I got to work with um, a guy called Chet Wilson, who took me through my first instructor things. And that pretty much was the start of it. You gave me a call a year and a half ago. Right. It was like 10 o'clock at night. Was it really? It was late. Um, <laughs> So it just goes to show what you shouldn't do after 10 o'clock at night. But the, um, yeah, so I gave, I gave Clint a call and asked him whether there would, he thought there'd be any traction for not just training teachers free of charge, because lots of trainers do that, but actually trying to bring a focus to it by creating a day that, um, that everyone who was offering a class on that day would offer places in the class free of charge to anyone who was you know, a school teacher or a custodian or a Boy Scout leader or stuff like that. And I went to sleep and I woke up and there was a website and there was like a whole <laughs> bunch of stuff. Was that one that, of those all-nighters you pulled? That Clint yeah. had done. So, yes, I had, I offered the suggestion, but it really was you, as you know, that did all the work. So. No, yeah, it was, it was your brainchild and you motivated me and, and inspired me to go ahead and do it. Right. But it's, um, it, it went quite well. I don't know what it w was like in a variety of other places, but in New Jersey, where, of course, people can't have concealed carry permits, we decided to run um, Stop the Bleed and Taser classes, and that's what we did last year. And that's going to be the focus of what we're going to do this year. Um, there's no facility for people to get concealed carry permits in New Jersey, and the New Jersey Education Authority is violently against it anyway. So uh, we decided that what we would do is, is offer these more um, first aid kind of things and less than lethal. Smart, it's important. We talk about tourniquets all the time and just on our EDC, EDC show that we just did, we all whipping out tourniquets left and right. You, you carry two tourniquets on you. Stopping the bleed is important, so. I think the, the big thing that came, brought that home to me was when we saw all the video from Parkland. I mean, the, the, the guy who was doing the murdering was just wandering around completely unrestricted. But the really important thing was that even though the first uh, sheriff arrived after a minute and what, a minute and 39 seconds, I think it is, in that time, 20 odd people had been shot and several had been killed. And there was no one doing, able to do anything to retrieve the people that were uh, terminally injured. So the whole stop the bleed thing is really, really important, I think. Well, a lot of people don't necessarily recognize that even when first responders get there, when I say first responders, I mean the law enforcement, their job is not to take care of that person who's bleeding out. Stop they need the to killing. make sure they secure the area. So, you know, that's got to be a horrible choice to make, but that law enforcement officer is going to step over your body to go make sure that the whole area is safe before they administer any aid. Right, and they won't let the EMTs in right. either, right, and until right. the place is secure. The dynamics has changed over the years, too. It used to be that for uh, you'd show up, and then once you have a, a team that's been 
briefed on it and knows how to go into a, an active killer, I call them active killers, because focus focused on what they're doing, not what they're using, guns, right? Um, when they go in there, they're supposed to go in there as a unified team, but they realize over time people are dying while people are waiting around for a team to show up. So now it's just first person on the scene go in, and now they're actually changing the mindset too where they're trying to create teams where when they go in, they'll have EMTs, paramedics and such going in behind them breaking off. Because you're right, law enforcement's job is to stop the killing, then stop the dying, then evacuate. It's in, triage. In that order. Yeah. Exactly. Right. The stop the bleed classes are fantastic. Right. And you do those with Pete? I do those with Pete, um, uh, Pete, Pete Berenger, yeah. yeah. So uh, he is an EMT and uh, a whole bunch of other interesting training that he has as well. But yeah, so he runs, the, he runs that part of it, and then I run the taser part of it. And that's how we do that. Now, Taser, this came up in our last it episode. Uh, Taser is one of the official sponsors of National Train of Teacher Day this year. That's we, right. First year we did it, we wanted it to be just very grassroots and we didn't want to get to, we wanted to see what we could do as just people, as independent instructors. And this year, uh, USCCA is sponsoring as well as Taser. Perhaps you can uh, talk a little bit about how that came about and what you would teach in a Taser course. But specifically distinguishing Tasers from um, contact stun guns. So tasers are the ones that send out the little harpoons on wires and uh, can be used to subdue people. The civilian version of the taser uh, is tricked out so that when you squeeze the trigger it continues to discharge for 30 seconds. So, and the idea is that you can put it down and then escape to a safe place. Um, so in, in a taser class what you do is you go to the very basics. You teach people about how the body's electrical circuits work and you teach people about how the taser interferes with those and giving a very high voltage but low current you can uh, cause someone to be incapacitated but not severely injured and in fact tasers are amongst the safest of any kind of defensive weapon I think there's been millions of discharges and there's not been a single fatality or serious injury so that's that's really good and it's also really appealing to lots of people who don't like the idea of using a lethal weapon for whatever reason. No, the, I mean, with law enforcement, the CED, conducted energy device, conducted energy weapon, whatever you want to call it, in New York State they call them CEDs, mm -hmm. um, they're five seconds, 50,000 volts. Right. So you had said 30 seconds for the civilian, so what is, what is that, the voltage on The that? voltage is the same. Okay. So it's, it's, it's 50,000, <laughs> well, no. <laughs> Five seconds, 50,000, I've done that. You, <laughs> I don't know if I want 30 you seconds. You know, you get what you play for. Yeah, that's true. So, but, the, but the idea is that you can, you can escape. Safe distance. Yep. Yeah, so you can get into your car, you can call the police. And in fact, the latest version of the taser links up to an app on your cell phone. So as soon as you discharge it, it automatically calls the police and, bring, and lo brings them to your location. Can, can you remotely like give them another light, 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 light them up again? I don't think you can do that, <laughs> but if you, ha if you have someone in your home, mm -hmm. then you would probably have to do that because the thing about the taser is as soon as the current stops, the person regains full right. capacity of yep. their muscles and they're likely to be a bit unpleased. So um, the, the civilian taser allows you to do um, 50 separate 30 second wow. discharges. So um, I don't know whether you could actually hold someone at bay for 25 minutes, Yeesh. but potentially that's, that's there in the device. So there's plenty of time to hold someone at bay uh, till the police arrived, or in the context we were talking about a school, um, an active school murdering situation, then you could hold someone at bay until um, people could just come together around you and subdue them. Because of the near impossibility of obtaining a carry permit in, in New Jersey, how many people are coming to you to take the taser classes? Do you, do you get a fair bit of uh, clientele for that? So it's interesting, the taser classes, for some reason, um, there's not a lot of traction for them. We've done taser classes in places like churches and synagogues and stuff like that, where Smart. people are thinking about yeah. the security of their environment, yeah. um, and they know that they can't have firearms. And we've looked at, you know, play, you know, points of reference. Well, remember, these wires are only so long. Mm. So if you're going to, you want to have someone placed here and someone placed there and yeah. what choke points may be and stuff like that. Uh, but those kind of devices are not the answer, the only answer to security. You've got to have 
a real security mindset. So they need to have greeters and looking for people that may be coming for the first time and all that kind of stuff. Striking conversation, being close to somebody, um, talking to them, keeping eye contact on them. Uh, in law enforcement, we say that hands kill, eyes show intent, or eyes are the gateway to the soul, and bad things happen under the cloak of darkness. So if you have well lit area, lit areas, you're making eye contact with people, and you're watching their hands, you can stop or thwart a lot of efforts or a lot of things, or at least get that, that jump on that situation a lot faster than uh, normal. The greeters are the first line of defense, and they're the ones really picking up on all those little signals to maybe tip the next guy off in in the in the hierarchy, if you want to yeah. call it that, the, the right. uh, security hierarchy. Let's watch this guy over there. Keep an eye on. Especially being shut it down at the parking lot level, right? They're they're greeters out in the parking lot, even in a case like that, and they see something happening, they can you know lock the building down. But that does no good if it's a glass door, right? Because gla glass only keeps good people honest. Exactly. Like they got into Columbine, they shut the doors and walked in. Right. Same at. Um Sandy Hook, it was the yeah. same thing. Yeah. So speaking of that, something that made me think, uh, what you just said, Clint, with teaching them to shoot, do you, do you go into the process of AII, acquire, identify, isolate, and, and make their, their plot, knowing their target and beyond, or behind, <laughs> knowing what's beyond, behind their target so that way they're not hitting innocent people on the other side? Do you get into any of that as far as the, the acquiring the target? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's part of what we have to that's, do. If we right. decide that we want to take that shot, we need to make sure we understand what's around that target because it could really be a bad day. All right, and it's an important aspect of people's training as well. Mm -hmm. It's not how they shoot relative to one another is not necessarily good or bad, but they have to know the shot that they can make. And so you might be able to make one shot at such and such a distance, and I can only make that shot at a much closer distance. Right. And that's both okay, so long as we both know what that is. Sure. And, you know, and you know your strengths and your weaknesses. Yeah. Know thyself. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right, because people mustn't doubt, they mustn't second guess themselves at that moment. Right. They've got, to, if, they, if they make a decision, then they've got to go. And so part of making the decision to go is knowing in themselves that I can hit that right now. So let's, let's take it a, a little bit of a different route and go back to the school like we were talking about a little bit. What are your guys' thoughts as far as arming teachers and having teachers armed in schools? We are seeing a lot of laws being passed, a lot of um, politicians coming up with laws to say we don't want anybody armed in the schools, such as New York just put in a bill saying that nobody in the schools can be armed because by law they could uh, the, the school administration could give a written permission for somebody, a civilian, to be armed in a school. And I've trained two schools, private schools, in upstate New York, and all their staff, they've gone through firearms training with me, and as long as they pass, then they could carry in the school, and the schools would let them. But now the state's actually trying to say, no, we don't want that. The only people that can carry is law enforcement, and they're going to add to the law security guard, armed security guards and res armed uh, resource officers, school resource officers. So what are your guys' thoughts as far as teachers being armed and the laws that are like Florida, the one that Florida just... Well, the, the, the really interesting thing about the Florida decision was how the sheriff who conducted the investigation changed his mind. Mm -hmm. He had been very against teachers carrying even their personal firearms. And then after having reviewed the video and all the thing about Parkland, he himself changed his mind because the video shows tragically that this person was able to wander around the school pretty much at will. And even if people had not staged outside but had come in straight away, he still would have had all that time. And the same thing was true in Parkland. There were teachers who confronted this guy with nothing but a loud voice and the best intentions. Mm -hmm. And actually the same was true in Dunblane in 1990. The teachers had nothing to protect the kids with except their own actual bodies. Mm -hmm. So I think, me personally, I think it's very important that teachers who want to mm -hmm. and who are willing to take whatever training and who get the legislative and liability support of their, their school structure can carry firearms because they're the only people that can make a difference at that moment. Well, when, when Grant and I were coming up with the, we call them the talking points, like you, they could be policy, really. Mm -hmm. uh, we decided that we, as National Train a Teacher Day, we weren't in favor of a government nationally sanctioned arm a teacher program. I think that's no. a horrible idea. But, you know, the answers to all problems in this country throughout history has always been in the exercise of rights. So if you are a teacher and you're a law abiding citizen and you have your concealed carry permit or license to carry a, a firearm as it is here in Pennsylvania, you should be able to do that at work, just like you do at the beach or at the mall or wherever else, you know, at the park. And you so, know the bad guys are. 
Pardon? Because you know the bad guys are. Yeah, yeah right. that's right. The bad guys. Right. Yeah. So yeah. as far as that's concerned, you know, teachers that want to arm themselves, and if they have to jump through certain hoops in certain states, well, that's kind of a state's rights issue there, really. But I think ultimately every law-abiding citizen that is able to carry in their state should be able to do that at work, too. Because we don't teach run through the halls and shoot. That's not something that, you know, a lot of people think that's what would right. happen. Right. You know, we You're still, just like in our home defense courses, we want them to barricade themselves in that room and guard that door. And if the bad person decides that they want to come through, well, they're going to meet, meet a great deal of efficient resistance. And this whole business of people resisting as opposed to um, just surrendering has been shown time and time again to be very effective. It started with the review of what happened at Virginia Tech, mm -hmm. the classrooms where the students and the teachers barricaded the door, made it difficult, they're all the ones that survived. Mm -hmm. And the classes where they just lined up against the wall, well, that's where all the ones were killed. Yeah, because the active killers, they want, they want quick in, out, they want to just get in. High take, body take their targets yeah. and, and get done as quick as possible and either, like we were talking about earlier, either retreat, get into a gunfight and die or off themselves. Yeah, we were talking earlier, we had a, we, we broke bread and had dinner just about an hour or so ago. And one of the things we discussed uh, while we were eating was the run, hide, fight is what's taught to a lot of people, but a lot of times the fight is kind of like an afterthought. Right. And really we see more and more with every one of these horrible acts of evil that take place. If fight. the fight were to take place earlier, yep. you could make a pretty good argument that that event would have uh, stopped or not have taken as much uh, much toll on, on the people that were in the building. And that's what's happened twice in the last month. Yeah. Once in Carolina and mm -hmm. once in Colorado. Colorado. Um, kids in the class actually went for the, sh the murderer and other people escaped. And the tragedy is that both of those people lost their lives, but nonetheless, many, many more people were saved than if everyone had just huddled in the corner. Right. So Grant, I have a question. We'll change the topic slightly here. Sure. I, I noticed that your accent is, is it Chinese or? Uh, <laughs> oh man, that must be some kind of a hate crime. Right, so. Korean? <laughs> Korean? Korean. <laughs> no, I'm from Glasgow in Scotland, so. Scotland. So my Not from these parts. My question is, when, whenever you go home, I assume you go back at some point in time to visit family, what mm -hmm. do they say when you tell them that you're a firearms instructor? I've always been curious. What, how's that viewed upon when you go back home? Have they ex excommunicated you, or wait? That's or is it a, is it a cool thing, or is it, it controversial, or it, it's it's not a cool thing, oh. and it's kind of like they accept it. Um, the concept of people having firearms in Britain is very very different from here. So the police aren't armed, for example. Well, some poli the airport police are armed, for example, and then they're armed. There are armed police units yeah. but the general police officer on the street is not armed apart from what do you call these things that flick out the Time. batons yes um so and there are people very aggressively against the police being armed yeah. because they feel that it would just break the whole ethos of the country so no people just accept it that you know grant likes to shoot and grant teaches people to shoot because grant's been teaching people to do stuff for a very long time and it's a kind of a natural thing Okay. Uh, the only person that raised uh, any kind of a query about it was one of my cousins who had been in the Royal Marines, and he just looked at me and said, what? <laughs> so that was that, really. Um, but, but no, people accept it. People accept it, and it's, it's quite good. And you don't go and kind of like talk about it all the time because right. people get bored with it. So, so a question on that then, since the police aren't armed, do all the bad guys put their guns down because the police aren't armed over there? So... so the crime rate? Hmm. There's a lot of, uh, there is a, lot, a relatively large amount of armed crime. There's a, re a relatively large amount of knife crime. Mm. And there's a relatively large amount of acid, mm. th throwing acid at people crime. Mm. Um, so, it, which really just goes to show that if one kind of Never weapon is withdrawn, this. people are going to find something else. Well, well evil people criminals. will find a way. Yeah. Criminals are going to do crime. So, but the big thing in Glasgow was always knives. Uh, so what you, what you call box cutters, here we call them Stanley knives in Scotland. Another good reason to carry a tourniquet. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'd like to thank you for coming on the show tonight. Definitely. No, yeah. thank you. It's a great opportunity. We're all here for the USCCA Expo. Uh, we're, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. We're, actually. we're all really going to be involved in that heavily over the next couple of days. And we set the studio up here. Normally, we, we kind of broadcast from two cameras, and, and now we're all here Skyping in the same it. place. 
So I want to thank you for coming out, and I want to thank, thank you. you for being the brainchild of National Trainer Teacher Day and, and motivating me, and we've, we're doing some good stuff together. And, and uh, we've got a lot of people that have volunteered their time mm -hmm. last year, and we've got more instructors oh, many this, more year. this year. And it's, it's going to be a great thing. National Trainer Teacher Day is July 20th, 2019. That's the second annual National Trainer Teacher Day. Look forward to seeing you on July 20th. You're watching Meet the Pressers with Matt Mallory and Clint Macro. Meet the Pressers. We had the tremendous honor to sit down and talk to Michael Bain. We spoke to him about red flag laws. And based on a simple allegation, your rights can be infringed. We've got a, a very distinguished guest here, Michael Bain, and I cannot do his, uh, his career in history justice, so I'm going to let him give a little intro on, uh, on his illustrious career and where he's been and what he's done. I did bring a cane and a straw hat, but <laughs> for some reason, I don't understand why Matt had such a problem with that. I mean, you know, a good dance routine is super. Uh, <laughs> short story, Cliff's Notes version. Right now, I'm a producer for Outdoor Channel, Shooting Gallery, my flagship show. We're doing our 20th year in 2020. Uh, 13 years of the best defense. It's uh, the only television show I know of that has legitimate saves, documented saves of people who did things that we suggested and they didn't end up dead. I also produced Gun Stories with Joe Montana, which I truly believe is the best gun show on earth. Um, I go pretty much back to the beginning. In the late 70s, uh, I was lucky enough to fall in with bad companions, people like Jeff Cooper and Ken Hackathorn. And, and I mean, it was an odd group. and, and that, back then, the, the world of, we called it combat shooting. It wasn't, it wasn't practical shooting yet. It was combat shooting. Yeah. And it, it was a really small universe. And it, it just kind of expanded out from that. It's uh, an odd thing. I've always been a journalist. Uh, I've made my living as a writer for like 20 years. 21 nonfiction books and uh, one novel. And I can honestly say I'm the only rock critic from Rolling Stone that ever ended up in this room. <laughs> <laughs> Now, now we know why. I'd yeah, never be able to say yeah, that. I'm that's, pretty sure Mr. Amazing. Winter would never let me work for him again. <laughs> Those days are long gone. So, so we wanted to get together and talk about red flag laws. It's a big thing that's coming up, big thing that's, that's in everybody's mind, being a bearing false witness, somebody saying that you've done something wrong and we just want to make sure your guns are taken because we don't like guns. So what's your thoughts on that? What's your experience? And, and we know you're an advocate for us. Yeah. So tell us. I, I, at this point, I'm honestly terrified. Uh, Colorado passed the Bloomberg model. Essentially, what, what Michael Bloomberg does, and, and he is, if I may say this, a nasty little fascist. From New York. From New York. He's got unlimited funds. His legal team draws up model laws. And I think the hardest thing for people to realize is they're not laws in the sense of, oh, we're going to, you know, help people or do anything like that. They're weapons against us. That's what they're designed to do. The Colorado law is so broadly drafted, it simply does away with the concept of due process. Yes. I mean, anybody, you, you could call, there's going to be an 800 number, you can call and say, Michael Bain and I were close, but I'm afraid of him now. And that's enough for the court order yeah. to come kick my door and yeah. take the guns. And then at the end of 364 days, I have to show a preponderance of evidence that I'm not crazy. Mm. Tell me how you prove that. I mean, how do you prove that you're not? Where's the due process, right? And it's, it's I mean, it's not even a Second Amendment issue. This is yeah. a pure D Fourth Amendment due process issue. Absolutely. You know, and again, I mean, the way these laws are drafted, you're not allowed to face your accuser. No. I mean, these are, these are things that we got from the Magna Carta. I mean, this is yeah. not stuff that right. we thought out last week. It's, you know, it came from the Magna Carta through the founders, the concept of due process, the concept of being able to face your accusers. And now we're saying, well, it's different. You know, it's mental illness. I mean, if you look at the worst totalitarian regimes on earth, every one of them has used quote unquote mental illness as a lethal weapon, mm -hmm. every one of them. And so when people are saying, well, it's for your own good, no, it isn't. Yeah. Um, I, and I'm honestly not sure what to do. I mean, we are meeting, uh, my sweetie and I, she is a shooter, she's a lawyer, she's an advocate. We're meeting with our local sheriff's department because I, I need to express my concern to local law enforcement. I'm like, you, you, you just can't kick my door at 4 a.m. Yeah. It's, it's not a good thing. And, and it's not safe for anybody. And I think that, yeah, it's... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's, he, Cause you don't know if somebody's kicking your door at 4 a.m. You don't know if they're good or bad. You're, well, I live way out in the country, and somebody yells police. I don't, I don't believe them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, in fact, um, because I live in rural Colorado, and Colorado still there's parts of it that are the rural west. Right. Uh, there was a traffic accident. It looked like my car. The sheriff's department sent somebody out, and my phone rings. It's the sheriff, and he goes, "Hi, Michael." I said, "Hi, sheriff. What can I do for you?" And he goes, "Look out your window." I'm like, 
He goes, there's a plainclothes detective standing there. He's holding his badge over his head. Can he proceed up your driveway? I said, sure, I'm cool. And he goes, okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure. But that's the rural West, you know, this sensitivity to property rights. Sure. But, um, and it's not just me. For you guys, I mean, what, there's like 16, 18 states already? You're at risk. Absolutely. You are absolutely at risk because anybody who decides to dime you yep. can make it happen just like that. And then here I am. I'm not crazy. No, really, I'm not crazy. And you're fighting it. Yeah, we had one pass, uh, House Bill 2060, that passed last fall in Pennsylvania. And a lot of people think this is a Democrat thing, but it certainly isn't. In Pennsylvania, I can say it was passed by Republicans. And one of the, the downfalls, folks that are somewhat open to legislation, keeping an eye on what's happening in their state capitals, as you said, this isn't slides a Second right Amendment thing. By. It slides right in, in in another way, and so folks aren't necessarily as in tune to it. And ironically, I am not against red flag laws. My, my father, rest his soul, uh, you know, shade tree gunsmith, all these guns. I mean, really, maybe the worst shooter I ever met. Everything he taught me about shooting was wrong. He just got to, he missed the entire boat. Um, but at the end of his life, and there's some issues with dementia, and yet he had a house full of guns and a house full of other kids and stuff, and there wasn't a mechanism to take those guns away from him, and he needed them taken away. Uh, I took them, you know, and after he pointed a gun at an eight-year-old kid. And he goes, I was just joking. I said, does not matter. Does not matter. But it has to be with due process. It has to follow the Constitution. Indeed. And I think we've, I think we've gotten in the society, gotten to a mindset of, I don't like them, so I'm going to do whatever I can to ruin them. Right. The, the bearing false witness, the, the morals and the ethics are out the window. And, and I think that that's the scariest thing, because as legal law-abiding gun owners and, and users of firearms, we want to do the right thing. And if we don't agree with somebody else, no matter what side they're on, and they don't like that, then they're going to do what they can to, to stomp us out. And this gives them a tool to do so. An easy tool. Yeah. So. And I, I think we've managed to get to the edge. I think we've managed to get to the precipice. Um, you could say the old, the old line is that, that uh, Republicans think Democrats are wrong, Democrats think Republicans are evil. Um, we, we found a place where the middle ground is gone. Mm -hmm. And I am not actually sure how one walks back from the edge of the precipice. I'm not, I, because from my own standpoint, as an advocate, as somebody who's been an advocate, a Second Amendment activist for a long time, here's the dealio. I'm not going to give you anything. Because every time that we've given, we lose. Take an inch, give them. Take an inch, take an inch, and it's another one. It's another. And so when they, you know, I've, I've talked to, to people on the other side, and they're like, what are you willing to give? I said, not a damn thing. I'm sorry. I've yeah. given you all you're going to get from me. Right. Anything else you have to but take. But you got to compromise. you, you got to compromise. That's right. Compromise. Cause... Consensus is a disease. Yeah. I mean, I, I know some people really like it and stuff like that, but uh, I remember talking to, uh, um, you know, one of the other issues that's 100% uh, polarized is abortion, right? Mm -hmm. no. It's, there is no middle ground. You're here, there. And, you know, one of, one of the activists on one side said, you know, you want me to compromise? So you're asking me how many dead babies I'll agree to. And I said, ooh. But that's sort of the situation that we're in. Yeah. You know, we've, we've given the ground. You know, we've given the ground. We've given the ground. And now they're like, well, it's not enough. And I, one thing I've said, and I, uh, again, we mentioned earlier, I was talking to a, a really neat Jewish couple down who are very, very worried. I feel very strongly that, that and maybe I'm an extremist, um, <laughs> I feel very strongly that at the end of common sense gun reforms, there's a boxcar with our name on it. Mm. Because the song always is the same, and it always begins the same. Um, in one episode of Shooting Gallery that I'm, I'm particularly proud of, I wanted to explain some Second Amendment issues, and I went to Auschwitz to explain them. And I explained wow. them standing under the guard towers. And then I walked to the boxcars and said, uh, quoting Judge Alex Kaczynski in the Ninth Circuit, I said, a free society only gets to fail once. Mm. I said, and this is the end. This is what happens when you screw up. And I said, we in America don't actually believe that. We, you know, there, there, there hasn't been an enemy for so long, we now no longer believe there's an enemy. And uh, to me, that's a terrifying thing. And it's, again, I, I myself, I don't understand how to step back from it. Uh, you know, I, I talk to people and they say, well, 
you know, where's your line? My line's pretty much right there. You've pushed me to it. All right, I'm on it. Ready to go over the cliff. Yeah, when an elected official's answer to any problem is the limitation or restriction Absolutely. of the rights of a law-abiding citizen, it doesn't matter what right it is, exactly. free speech, whatever. In this case, with the Second Amendment, it's, it can't be tolerated. And I really believe that the true fourth check and balance of our government is the armed, educated citizenry. And those that are not for liberty recognize that, and that's why they're attacking us, the law-abiding gun owner. Well, I, one of the things I said years ago, and I was really taken to task for, uh, it was just a short line. I said, you, do, you guys don't understand. This interview, I said, they don't hate guns. Mm -hmm. They hate us. Mm -hmm. Guns are just the tools with which they use to attack us. We represent a culture that they can't assimilate. I mean, the Borg can't assimilate us. And so the Borg then has to do something about that. In Colorado, on the red flag law, most of the sheriffs in the state will not enforce. They, uh, they've said so. We're not going to do it. And uh, only sheriffs that have said they'll enforce are those in the county that Denver's in, the county that Boulder's in. And same thing with the, the capacity laws and same thing with universal background checks, is that we don't enforce that. Well, if you think about that, that's not good. You know, at the point that you say, this is a law I'm going to enforce, and this one, what the hell, for whatever reason I'm not going to, right. then, then the whole structure of jurisprudence starts crumbling. Yes. You know, we just pass laws like popcorn. Indeed. And, and, and we don't understand the implications of them, and we don't understand when, when someone who is a vicious opportunist like Bloomberg says, wait a minute, wait a minute. The universal background check law that Bloomberg's lawyers drafted it has nothing to do with universal background checks at all. Nothing. Its specific purpose is to criminalize the things that we do on an everyday basis. Mm -hmm. You and I go to the range, I hand you a gun. Well, that's an illegal transfer. Yes. You hand it back to me, that's another illegal transfer. It's four felonies we've committed in, what, 30 seconds? Sure. Back and forth. And you think, well, that's crazy. And he goes, no, it's not. It's a tool. It's a yep. weapon. Well, even, even the Colorado law is so broad, which is not enforced, is that let's say I go on the road. I have, I have safes sunk in concrete. They're really secure. But we have a house sitter. Technically, he can't be there. Technically, the possession. minute I go on the road, he takes and he comes into my house, he is now in possession of all those guns in that safe, even though he has zero access to them. It's like, well, what was the point of that? It's, you know, what, who, you know who it hurts? Soldiers. You get deployed, you leave the gun with your wife, congratulations, you just made your wife a felon. Yeah. Um, and I, again, I'm, I'm, what we're missing is understanding, you know, guys. I mean, I, that's what I don't see when, you know, I've done presentations on universal background check. And the first thing people say is, that, why are you against universal background checks? I said, I don't care anything at all about universal background checks. What I'm against is somebody building a weapon specifically to hurt me. Targeting the wrong Targeting wrong the wrong group. Yeah. I mean, why don't you target people who are dangerous? Ones that break the laws, ones that enforce the laws. <laughs> it turns out they're criminals. I mean, it turns out they're actually bad people out there, but it's... Um, it's a slippery slope. It, and we're on it. Yeah. And much. it's sliding. Yeah, yeah. We're, it, when you, you had said earlier as far as the, the country and being pushed up to the edge, and it kind of made me think of, you know, are we a, a country in condition white? We're in a unique position as cultures. I mean, for the very first time in the history of man, mm -hmm. the wolf isn't at the door. You know, we don't, have to, we don't have to worry about the crops failing and our kids starving. Right. We don't have to worry about Genghis Khan leading the hordes in or Cersei Lannister, like, sacking the city. And so we now no longer believe that happens. But uh, uh, as I said, you know, having, having been to Auschwitz, having stood under the guard towers, having explained the Second Amendment in those, nobody in, in Germany in 1930 thought, thought that either. Right. You know, at no point, I mean, it was a very sophisticated culture. I mean, it was maybe the most sophisticated and uh, intelligent culture in Europe. And it took it, what, five years to fall off the end of the world. In a sense, the red states are getting redder and as the blue states get bluer. And, you know, those of us in Colorado and, and say, Arizona, those transitional purple states, you know, we're, we're, we're working on it. I, always well, say, I can say here in Pennsylvania, a lot of our strength as far as pro-gun rights has always been with the pro-gun Democrats. We always had a yeah, lot of pro-gun yeah. Democrats here. And that... That generation is now not running anymore, or they're getting voted out, or they're retiring, and now we have this new generation of the Socialist Democrats taking over, and that's where we're seeing the shift here in Pennsylvania. Well, that's what Colorado was. I mean, the, the Colorado Democrats were ranchers, you know? Yeah, right. And they're old hard boys, you know? <laughs> Texas they, Rangers, too. They ran cattle. Yeah. You know, they were, they were as 
they were the Democrats, but they were not liberal. Um, none of the ranchers are ever liberal. Well, well, thank you for coming on the show with us. Thank it's, you very much for having me. I, I appreciate it. We're, we're building the show and making it grow, and, and it's just such an honor to have someone like you on the show with us. That was good. Yeah. All right. With regards to extreme risk protection orders, one thing firearm owners need to be aware of is that the proposals provide that a basis, one of the bases for issuance of an extreme risk protection order, otherwise known as a red flag order, is the fact that the individual recently attempted to or did purchase a firearm. So the exercise of a constitutional right is a basis to issue that extreme risk protection order that strips the individual of that same exact constitutional right. That's absolutely obscene. Frank Maloney, Renaissance Firearms Instruction. This is Meet the Pressers with Matt and Clint. Meet the Pressers. We're able to take a moment and talk to John Correa. He's the founder of Active Self Protection. Let's hear what he has to say about covering your ASP. So John, why don't you tell us a little bit about the, uh, the history of uh, Active Self Protection, how it started, how it came about, uh, and, and, and why you're uh, doing what you're doing. Yeah, I started the company in 2011. Um, I started carrying, oh, a number of years before that, and um, after I started carrying, realized that, man, if I, if I wasn't good enough with the gun on that day, then it was a liability to me if I couldn't really shoot it. So I started training a bunch, and uh, that's expensive. So. <laughs> Uh, honestly, started the company to write off ammo. That's the truth. Uh, so that that way, if I taught a few classes, then I then I had to be good and I had to go to class. And so, um, started the company in 2011, like most people do with NRA certs. You know, start teaching a couple of NRA classes. I started the online presence really in 2013. Um, uh, and, and this is funny but true. I. Uh, I, I pastored a church for 15 years, and as I got into the industry a little bit, as I got into training a little bit, um, the blue-haired ladies at church got frustrated with me sharing gun stuff on my Facebook, right? That wasn't pastoral for them. So I started a Facebook page just to get that stuff off my Facebook. Figured we just put the business over there, right? Um, and, and that quickly went nationwide. Like, all of a sudden, people from Ohio are commenting, and I'm like, why, why does somebody from Ohio care what I think about concealed carry or whatever? Uh, um, so we started growing that. Uh, and the videos came because I really wanted to make my training evidence-based. So I, I wanted to know what really happens in defensive encounters. Uh, had somebody send me a real-life knife attack that was like, whoa, and I'm a martial artist, have been for a long time. Took, went to my teacher and was like, dude, this is serious stuff. We really need to adjust at least my training to, to do this better. And uh, so that was eye-opening to me. So I started using those to tell other people, hey, here's something that you gotta be able to do. Here's what a real attack looks like. Real energy, real you know issues, <laughs> and um, then the funny part was is that where the modern in incarnation of active self protection came from was because somebody sent me a video that had this really long intro, like of nothing, you know, just like a surveillance video of nothing, of two minutes, and then 30 seconds of action. So I was trying to figure out how do I cut that two minutes off, and I had some software on my computer. Well, I was I was you know went on YouTube to go how do I use this software, and one of the things it said on the software was hey you can record audio on your laptop for it, and I was like, oh, that'd be cool, I could voiceover. be like, yeah, I could do a voiceover and be like the John camera, the John Madden of on-camera violence, this would be hilarious. <laughs> that's cool. And that's where it came from. So, uh, those, that really took off. So, we moved from Facebook, I mean, we still have a Facebook page, it's still there, 290,000 something people wow. follow it. Um, in 2016, YouTube was like, hey, you can monetize your channel if you want, we'll pay you. And I was like, that's like walking down the street and finding $5 bills laying around, right. why would exactly. you not do that? So, shifted over to YouTube in 2016. Um, April 2016, they, they gave me the green light for that. We had about 6,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel at the time. Uh, and it's grown from there to now almost 1.4 million. So, uh, this active self protection became my full time job in 
January of 2017. Uh, uh, the pastor became part-time at that point and then became my only job in February of 2018. So <clears throat> every every month since then, we've uh, thanked the Lord above for paying the mortgage and paying the staff. And, and now I get to travel the country, uh, teach people classes. I get to travel the country, take classes. As a student, I train. I'm really serious. When I quit my job, uh, I told my wife, I was like, Look, babe, now I'm gonna train like it's my job, because it is, like yeah. this is my life now. And she's like, hey, as long as the staff gets paid, as long as I get paid, as long as you don't borrow no money, do what you want. Remember you said that. And, uh, <laughs> now, it's in the, now it's on camera. Yeah, yeah, no, it, and she's been great about that. Uh, she's gotten to the point where she's like, oh, okay, enough, like I need you around the house maybe a little bit more. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, but um, what a cool thing. I mean, I get to go travel the country, meet awesome people. Uh, the vast majority of people in the firearms and defensive training world are fantastic people. Um, you know, any industry's got a few outliers, but uh, most people are amazing. I get to help people in, in actual, um, tangible ways. We get messages now at least once a week from somebody who's like, dude, you saved my life. Now, now, of course, I always say, I didn't save your life. I had No, you saved your life, but tell me what happened. Well, this thing went down and I heard your voice in my head. And so I did this thing and I came out okay. So I have, let's see, a couple of classes coming up here. I have, um, I am taking in two weeks, I'm taking a week-long class with Bill Blowers um, and uh, Bill Riley, the uh, Surefire, the Battle of the Bills. Uh, Surefire invites some riders and, and uh, gun folk out to do some stuff and show off their products, of course. Uh, I really love how they do it though because they couch that within, hey, we'll pay really awesome teachers to train you 30, give you 30 hours of training and if you show up and we'll bring all the videographers and all that stuff and give you all the content. Uh, yeah. yeah, yes please, thank right. you, right. amen, right. hallelujah, right? Um, let's see, this year I've still got um, a Range Master, Master Firearms Instructor certification. That's gonna be a big one for me this year. Uh, Tim Heron shooting. I've got Gabe White coming up later this year. Um, I have three goals this year with pistol. I'm, I'm really serious with my pistol skills this year. Uh, I wanna earn a Gabe White turbo pin. That's a big one for me. Um, I wanna earn a, uh, an Ernest Langdon fast coin. And I want to earn a modern samurai project black belt uh, patch. Those are spicy, man. Those are no, no it's joke. Aggressive. It's aggressive, but uh, I think I can do it if I if I keep after it. So really Lord training hard. Lord willing, in a creek don't rise. We've got classes coming up in. Um, if you just go on our Facebook page uh, or on our website, go on the events tab to see where we are. I know we've got classes in Nebraska. I've got a class coming up in June in Colorado in uh, Denver. I've got. Uh, let's see. We're going to be. I'm going to Brazil in August. Um, yeah, Magtech's one of my sponsors, and they make ammo in Brazil, and they're like, hey, come down. I'm like, I guess, let's do that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I got classes all over the country. I know we're gonna be in, uh, looks like we're gonna be in Florida this year. We're gonna be in Wisconsin this year. I'm gonna be in Iowa this year. Big one is the National Conference. So the Active Self Protection National Conference is the last weekend in September in um, at Tallgrass Shooting Sports at Living Water Ranch, Olathe, Kansas. Um, I, I, I know, you know, I'm not pipping stuff too much, but what, here's what we decided to do. National conference was a big deal to have uh, really great instructors come and, and help people in big ways. But and, and it's not wrong to do this as a as a, a for-profit enterprise. Okay, so to make money at it is not a problem at all. But the Lord's given me a, a platform, and I said, look, let's just do good with it. And so um, the the owners there of, of Tallgrass Shooting and the Living Water Ranch, it's it's a camp where they mostly have you know Christian churches come out and and do summer camps and stuff like that. But they also do the Flint Hills Foster Team Camp. So the kids that age out of the foster system, about 50% of them are immediately homeless. And so they give these kids a place to live, uh, particularly abused and abandoned teens, um, teach them life skills and get them off into the world with some hope and some abilities. And they do it out of their own pocket. And Mike and Lisa Urban are incredible people. And so I thought, man, why don't we just do this as a, as a fundraiser for them? So instead of us doing anything, so, so what we're doing is, is we're asking for the corporate donors uh, who are giving to Living Water are going to pay for all the instructors to come in and pay. The instructors are all donating their time, but I don't want them to donate plane tickets too, you know what I mean, or whatever. So they're paying for them to come in, and then everybody who attends, uh, it includes food, it includes uh, all your classes, and there's a hundred spaces that people can stay. It's like monk style uh, living. And um, if you make a, a, a donation to the uh, Flint Hills Foster Team Camp, you get to come to the conference. So it's 100% tax deductible, uh, and every penny goes to the kids. So what we're hoping is, I'm hoping, if we have 200 attendees, we will raise $100,000 for the Flint Hills Foster Team Camp, and uh, that would pay for, uh, $100,000 would pay for 12 kids for a full year of living there on, on site. So it would give 12 people who may not really have a chance at getting off into the world with any hope, 
of not being in the system, of not, you know, end up incarcerated or drug addicted or whatever, hope. So that's what we're trying to do, and uh, it's going to be a good time. We're, we're, we're jokingly calling it the five Bs. We're going to have bullets. We're going to have Bibles. We're going to have some Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. We're going to have some barbecue. We're going to have some burgers. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> that's great. Well, yeah, just, yeah, just, say, uh, I appreciate you doing all that. We're foster parents and adoptive parents, too. Oh, so amen. Well, you know, in our, in our exo, uh, Stephanie and her husband, Neil, are adoptive parents, and um, we uh, it's near and dear to my heart. So, you know, I think Jesus is a big deal on the last, the least, you know, about orphans. And so, we just want to you know, do good. And listen, if we can do good, have an awesome weekend, uh, have a lot of fun, learn something, and do good at the same time, like, why would we not do that? It sounds like fun. Yeah, so that's a big one last weekend in September. Well, thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you. Great to meet you. Yep. Great to have you. What's that you're doing is great. Thank you. Appreciate it, guys. This is Mike Brickner and Jake Morrow with USCCA Training Division. And this is Meet the Pressers with Matt Mallory and Craig Macro. Meet the Pressers. We sat down with Mike Hughes and Britt Lentz of Next Level Training. Next Level Training is the company that makes the CERT pistol, shot indicating resetting trigger. Great to yeah. be here, guys. So give us a little background on, you know, you guys went to high school together, if that's right? Yeah, uh, went played against each other a little bit. Yeah, oh! Football. Yeah, football. Yeah, yeah, college okay. football, and then yeah. met in childbirth class, like, <laughs> you know, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That. And then uh, <laughs> class was done, then the real education began talking about guns and everything, right? I was just getting competitive shooting, kind of brought Britt into that realm, so, yeah, it was good. Why is that? It was good. L let's good. be honest, it was Lamaze. It was quite boring was on our end. Uh, <laughs> cool, breathy stuff. Breathing. Yeah, 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 real yeah. good. And, and that coincides, because, you know, you got to breathe when you're shooting. Yeah, it's good breathing, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, honey, you're not breathing right. No, uh, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> it was good. Yeah, so I, I first started working with you guys a couple years ago. I actually met you at the uh, second USCCA instructor certification in Chicago. In Chicago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah. And uh, yeah. you're a filmmaker, and my background has been in music and television. And, yep. and a lot of great conversations we have had. So, yeah, I appreciate all the input you've given me. Yeah, qu quite, quite a few 10 o'clock at night calls on, hey, dude, what about this microphone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it started off, my, you, you really helped my professional career, and I want to thank you on this show. Uh, if it weren't for you, I don't know if I would have at least made the leaps and bounds I have professionally in the time that I have. Uh, Mike really went to bat for me with, uh, with NRA for doing the uh, Simcoe videos, and I really appreciate that. You guys have always been very supportive of what I've been doing, and uh, thank you. Yeah, well, you've always knocked it out of the park, so good job. No, I, good. The talent was obvious from the beginning. It's you, the way you can instruct is phenomenal. Yeah. You know, Thanks. Excellent. And, and I, uh, I want to thank you because I got introduced to you guys when you sponsored my Top Shots at Orange County Choppers. That's right. I had the three Top Shots, Gary Shank, uh, uh, Keith and Frank came in to do a charity event sure. at Orange County Choppers and you guys yeah. uh, donated some, some uh, stuff for the, for the show and it was good. So it was good. Oh, uh, your generosity uh, precedes you. All right. <laughs> so this, the CERT pistol has revolutionized training. It's something that I, I think is the best product out there, and, and we see them all over the place. I've promoted them all over, and a lot of my instructors use them. I use them a lot. What are some of the things you guys have coming up, yeah. uh, new, new releases? Well, you know, coming up, honestly, a lot of times, Clint, I mean, well, let's take a step back. I mean, how basic is a CERT, right? And like I like to say, and some people may have heard this before, it's very similar to the first home basketball hoop getting put up, all right? Yeah. Like, when do they come out? Like 60s, 70s, I don't know, you know? I don't, I don't, I don't know the history, but why not? I mean, 25. <laughs> it goes out early. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the point being is, is, I mean, do you have to go to the stadium to get the reps in? I mean, even right now, these little reps, okay, I make sure I'm certain, I got my little pocket pistol, go boom, let's get a few, few little reps with this the pocket pistol. And that low barrier to entry training um, is just so critical. And it's the high volume training and the immediate feedback, right? And just all of the diagnostics that come with that as far as your trigger control, working at your point of aim, working this. So, you know, I'm just, it's, so a lot of it as far as new, you know, it's kind of funny in this age of technology and, and I love new stuff. I love learning machine learning right now with our marketing. I love learning more about WordPress. I love learning, learning. But it always comes back to like these real basics of, hey, just let's do what it takes to get the reps in, right? And to get people just to get training and get more, just more of a lifestyle of just, of not like adding like, huge amount of intervention to their lives, but just take advantage of that white space 
during the day in their schedule just to sneak in these trainings. Like, if I can just convey to people how good they can get with a pistol, with these small micro trainings, you know, if I can just do that Spock mind meld, you know, <laughs> send out some energy waves in the ether just to, to illuminate that, um, I think. I think it'll just increase our whole Second Amendment, our, our capable citizenry, um, all these things that, that just well, make our country great and make the firearm ownership so awesome. You know, it's really it's really neat how you're relating the known to the unknown there. We're yeah. talking about basketball and yeah. you know sports. Exactly. It, it really, when you get, I was like, wow, that's that's actually pretty genius. How you do that, and it's it's reminiscent to your your career before all this, which was an attorney. Attorney, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, back in the day, I mean, a bit of leap from uh, training hours for dollars to full-on entrepreneurship, so that's been, it's been, it's been good. I, that's, it's a, I don't suggest anyone to do that. <laughs> I really don't. It's like one career change is going from a vine to another, generally, and swinging. Entrepreneurship is jumping in a cloud and <laughs> kind of hoping there's a vine in there. Yeah, there to yeah, grab. absolutely. But it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's like, it's, uh, well, it's uh, got to be kind of you know, batshit crazy a little bit yeah, to, yeah. to do that. Been there, brother. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Britt, you're you're always here. You're always behind him. You're right. always there. I know he, you're like the concierge. Uh, concierge. Country Hattie. Yeah, yeah, right. You're, Bodyguard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so what's what's your role officially with Next Level Trade? So basically, I was brought on to the originally for accounting. I'm an accounting background. Okay. I've been there my whole life. Uh, it's nice because I can kind of be the uh, run the operations. I'm, I'm obviously the president, CFO. Uh, handle a lot of the operations, the manufacturing, the whole back end side of things, mm -hmm. which I can obviously try to keep up with him on the front side because <laughs> he goes at 100 miles an hour, right? Out, out yeah. in front of it all with, with new ideas, new new directions we want to go with things. And it's fun. I absolutely love it. I wouldn't trade it for anything. I've, we get to do on a, on a daily basis what we love, yeah. which is obviously in the firearms industry, shooting, training, talking to people that are shooting and training, and in the industry. Cool, cool. You started off with the with the pro and the performer, and then the 107. And then the pocket pistol. Now you have the the floppy knives, yeah, the training nice. knives. Yeah. Got one. I got one. <clears> and the uh, the RMR simulator. Yeah, RMR. Yeah, that's that's good. We got this 320 coming out. Uh, yeah, you do. Uh, I just saw one right features. now. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, got some good pull from the marketplace. Kind of kind of held off on that until we saw a real good pull, and we, we see it now. So that's 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 actually pretty exciting. Um, we don't have it right now, but I'll tell you all like kind of a preview on this. Our new AR bolts Ooh, is really exciting uh it's been it's been in r d for a long time but we're going to get this one right uh, it's going to be designed proper it has a solenoid to jack the hammer back so it really truly is plug and play up put it in your upper battery pack actually in the magazine right uh pretty a little bit advanced circuitry and some sensor to figure out when it was dropped and reset and, and all that but i think we've got all that pretty hammered out. Cool. Uh, up to nine shots a second too. So wow. can't shoot the trigger. Yeah, you cannot shoot. We, that, that was a big one. That, that was a tough yeah. one too. Um, there was a little bit of magic in there to get enough amp turns and stuff to get enough jam to work in every trigger. Blah blah. I'm really excited on that. I'm really excited on that. That's like really we're getting back for final prototypes for fit function great. and cook it off the tooling quick because it's been a while. Like we had it at shot show. It's funny how you test stuff. I mean, we test it either in, a, say, a match or like a trade show. Now, you can go out and be roughing it on your own, do all this, but, but there has to be some kind of, like I said, the celestial ether of things, like you shoot a match, that's when your equipment fails. You know, you go yeah. to a trade show and show yeah. that that person, you know, this yep. and that, or pull it out, you know, that, that's yeah. what's gonna fail, right? Yeah. And there. <laughs> Murphy is really good at secret in there, so I think <laughs> yeah. we've, I think we've um, done some good vetting out on this. It's going to be it's going to be really exciting for AR-15 owners because you pull the trigger, it shoots a laser down the barrel. Yeah. You know, and just pop, 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 pop. So it's 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 it's. I love. I'm not. I'm not a rifle guy, and I love playing with it. Chat yeah, I, I use your current bolt now quite a bit, and I did a little piece on it in that marksmanship video that, that you yes, guys put out yes, in the yes, newsletter. Yes, yeah, it was and that was phenomenal that, piece. Actually. That one works very well. It just takes a little bit to get it put and together, but once it, you yep. get it set, so this will uh, eliminate that problem. Eliminate that issue, yeah, yeah, because it's not contingent on the trigger set. It's just just part of the design criteria on something like that is I didn't make it more plug and play, right? I and mean, that's what we're used to. Hey, we've got a hard drive. Let's plug it in the UFB port, and this yeah. part goes in the wall, Universal. and you're cooking, yeah. right? I mean, it's yeah. it's. It's people aren't like like when I like back in the day I, I remember getting an AR I got a, a JP trigger and I had to file this and file that and work that and 
I don't know. I, I guess I'm a little bit of a projectionist. Like, well, maybe people want to kind of fiddle and tweak. But you're also a mechanical uh, engineer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> so yeah. it's too yeah. So like, this is this really should be truly plug and play, and uh, it's plug it in. External batteries that can be removed from the magazine, so you can have others charging up. They're, they're the uh, I forget the name, the um, oh, 3.7 volt, the vape kind of like vape batteries. Yeah. They're yeah. very common. Okay, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So, so it's it's exciting. It's a good product. Big yeah, this thing, big the, thing for us was the fact that we wanted to, to make it from our, our goal from the beginning was your upper, your optics. Right? Yeah, that's the whole key. Yes, your sling, huge. your everything. That's huge. Now it's your sear. So it's everything. If you have oh, a trick out trigger, it's yeah. your sear. So that trigger break really is your break. And it's really uh, kind of odd because the reality is that cylinder moving inside gives you a little bit of recoil. It, it, uh, we don't call it recoil, we call it the sight disturbance, but the reality is it's not even that, it's just the noise of an action occurring, which is odd because it's it, into that it, mindset. It, there's no real recoil, but there's just a little bit of a sound that occurs, which is it, it's just a different, yeah, very enjoyable. It's yeah, Chad, cool Chad, uh, Chad was talking about it at Ailita, he was, he was pretty excited about it too, he mentioned it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. What, that's yeah. when I got the knife there, we were talking yeah. about it. Yeah. Yeah. The response from military and law enforcement. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Yeah. Very so, excited about it. So at the trainer update that we just went to, the USCCA trainer update this morning, they had mentioned that you're coming out with a new online program yeah. through the USCCA. So yeah. you want to talk a little bit about that? Tell oh. us uh, how that's going. And That's really fun. That's pretty exciting. I mean, there's really two programs on that. One's an end-user course, and then another is the uh, is like the sure. train the trainer yeah. constructor course. Yeah. You know, and a lot of that, too, it, it's it's kind of, it, you know, and I, you know, you have, Orders make you more experienced in this than I do, and you know, train the trainer, being a TC and all uh, through USCCA and it, right? But I mean, it's really trying to just put enough information for the trainer trainer course so they can put on another course. You know, uh, just like a lot of a lot of instructors have cert pistols, you know, even if they have five or six, right? Well, shoot, man, you can monetize that because you can have say 1,800, 2,000 square feet. Just hit a few drills, bring people in for a four-hour block or two two-hour blocks, you know, kind of a, whatever, six to eight p.m. type of deal. Yeah. Almost no out-of-pockets. Mm -hmm. And and get, just, just 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 add some value as far as the fundamentals. We we like to start with the fundamentals because we think all, not, we think a lot of students need another introduction, like another, another layer over of just mm -hmm. some real dedicated, structure as far as isolating trigger control, really looking at grip establishment, really testing a natural point of aim, getting like a hundred reps in right there, you know, natural point of aim, then dichotomizing that with some sights going right far away with a single shot. I, I could kill you with details, but point being on that, the whole objective is to give that instructor the substantive confidence to see that, get excited about that, and oh man, I can, I can, I can put that on for my students. I can provide more service to the students. I can monetize it. Mm -hmm. And that has to be part of the equation. Yeah, I mean, I mean we, we got to get more capitalistic. I mean, you know, be capitalist. We could be Baptists and this and that. We have to be capitalists as well, you know? I mean, and, I've, I've always considered that. myself to be a capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> I, I create I opportunities that. and I capitalize on it. I love it. That's perfect. <laughs> That's perfect. But, but I mean, like, it's, it's, you know, people should, because a lot of instructors, it's kind of a soft left. They, you know, I don't know if I want to make money or this but I think, I think they have a duty to, to add that value. So that student is like, yes, that, I see value. I want to pay the sixty dollars for this course, forty dollars, one hundred twenty for this course, or, or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever suitable there. To, you know, so that quid pro quo so makes it sustainable. So you know, that instructor's you know, wife or husband is happy about it. And yeah. It justifies time, and so it has to. I think we have to strongly migrate in that that, that monetary aspect of. of you know, making more money as an instructor, that's not a bad thing no, by, no, by any stretch. Um, and, but also, our goal on it is is to, to get that information out there for the instructors. Yeah, so that's, that's yeah, to Get out of the internet. I think it's a good idea to do it as an online course where now you can give it to anybody, they can do it at their leisure because everybody's so busy. Low well, barrier to entry. Yeah. They're already instructor, already USC, USCCA yep. instructor. I mean, and it's not rocket surgery. You just look at it and you think, and people like bastardize it. Take, put your own voodoo in it, right? Mm -hmm. and. You know, do your own things with that. I mean, heck, even if you get cardboard boxes and you do four hours, or that's a very long time, let's say two hours of compromised shooting positions, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, that's that's a big deal. And that's, that's pretty easy. Like, yeah. just say, hey, just put things up semi-randomly. Especially you know? with a cert pistol, you're not worried about projectiles leaving the property yeah, and things right. like that. Oh, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah. And you can watch a trigger finger, like getting into positions, getting out of positions, or, or uh, they're, they're disciplined with the handling of the pistol. It's, yeah, so it's, it's exciting. I'm excited on that. I really want to see, my dream is to see instructors out there get more, uh, 
just just it, it's more creative after people taking that first class marketing wise to to pull in pull people in and and take follow on classes. I think that's Definitely. I think I think that opportunity is there, just not fully fully exploited. Well, the thing that we hear all the time also is that instructors have a tough time getting on the page. You know, what I mean, to be able to yeah. put a course yeah. on. Yeah. We want to give them an opportunity where you can go into a hotel conference school. Right? Yeah. Conversations we've had for a long time. Right. 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 And, and 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 be able to do it and do it without the control of the the mafia style occurrence that can happen in some of these ranges that just kick you right off. Right? Oh. I know we've all been. Yeah. There, right? Range you know? politics is a thing. Oh, yeah. Buddy. Yeah. 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 Thank you guys, I really right. appreciate Thanks, your time. Good work. Oh, good work. Always, always, always. Awesome. Always. We have a lot of sponsors that made this show possible. Make sure you check them out and give them your business. This episode of Meet the Pressers is made possible with the generous support of PowerTech Flashlights, Lee Armory, and EZ2C Targets. Thank you. Thanks for watching the show. Make sure you like, subscribe, share, and click that little bell to make sure you know when our next episode's uploaded. Until next time, adieu. Meet the Pressers.